Good morning, everybody. Let's stand as we begin our service by singing our first hymn together. To God be the glory, and we'll stand as we sing. Julian would ask a blessing on our service this morning. Thank you, Jim. We are grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to be here this morning, Lord, to gather in this place, to gather on your word and to sing your praises, Lord, and to meet together and join in fellowship one with another. We pray your blessing upon our gathering, Lord. We ask that you might feel your presence amongst us, and Lord, we pray for the pastor as you bring your word to us in a little while, that you would just speak to him and that your word would really uh, speak to our hearts. So, Lord, we pray that by everything that's said and done here this morning, give honor and glory and praise unto you. And we ask you in our Savior's name. Amen. 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 All right, let's start sing our next hymn together upon life's boundless ocean. Mighty billows roll, and we we'll stand as we sing. <laughs>
In Jesus, the storms of life I'll drink. I'm anchored in Jesus, I breathe only the way I am. anchored in Jesus, I breathe only the way I am. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, just announcements for uh, the week ahead. Uh, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, is our uh, parent and toddler group, um, Bethany Baby. So please continue to be in prayer for that. Uh, it's a very, very busy morning. Um, so just pray for the mums and dads to bring the little ones along and pray for everybody that helps to set it up and takes care um, of that ministry. I know it is a is it is busy, but it's a real blessing as well. So pray for that. Tuesday, our craft ladies at 10 o'clock. Um, so if you can be in prayer for that little ministry as well. On Wednesday, um, Alice is going to be taking the Bible study. So if you can be in prayer for Alistair, uh, prayer meeting and Bible study will be at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And then on Friday, our youth ministries, uh, Blast and uh, Compass Club and Drama, from 5 o'clock through to 8.30. Again, if you can be in prayer um, for those ministries. We do have, um, obviously, communion after this morning service. So if you love the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then uh, please feel free to partake uh, in communion with us. Uh, we'll do that um, during today's service. And then we have, at the end of the month, um, we've got a, the last Sunday of the month after the service, uh, we're going to go to the upper room, and we've got a little session called Ask the Pastor. So I've had a few questions in so far, um, some really interesting questions. If you've got a question you'd like covered, or a topic you'd like covered, if you can get them to me as soon as possible. We won't obviously cover them all this session, but um, like I said, it started it primarily for the students we have come in on a Sunday night, and then a couple of people said, oh, um, can anybody come along? So we'll do it. Um, this month, we'll see how it goes. Um, if it's busy, then maybe we'll find another spot somewhere. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll give it a go. But that's, that's the past, that's the last Sunday of the month. Also, we will be combining um, the day, not the meeting, but the day for men's meeting and ladies' meeting. Uh, we are trialing this. Um, like numbers have been really down on both. So we're going to try this for a couple of months uh, and to see what we do then with those ministries. So on the second Tuesday, we're moving into the second Tuesday because the first Tuesday, you've got Young at Heart on the Wednesday and it, it seems to be um, men's meeting is a little bit quieter on the first Tuesday of the month. So we're moving to the second Tuesday of the month. We're going to try it in May, the second Tuesday in May. Ladies are going to meet downstairs Men are going to meet uh, in the extension there, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. So we're going to give it three months, and uh, we'll see how those, those ministries go. So that's the second Tuesday of May for the men's and ladies' meeting. Amen. All right. Uh, birthday's coming up. I've left the building in the foyer. Birthday's coming up this week. On Tuesday, it is Bernie's birthday. On Thursday, it is Katie's birthday. And on Saturday, it is Sibby's birthday. Is that right? Okay. No? You're not having a birthday anymore. Well, that's cheaper for Terry, so that's a blessing. <laughs> Amen. That just backfired, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. We pray the Lord will bless you. Is it Miley's birthday? When's your birthday? Tuesday. There we are. Well, happy birthday for Tuesday, and I pray the Lord will bless you all. We've got birthdays this week in the year ahead. Amen. All right. I haven't got any other... Oh, Sorry. Charlie's 18 on Friday, blame me. If you ask you, pray for, pray for Charlie, Andrew. Oh, yeah. Okay, young at heart. You, I tell you what, you're keeping Brother Andrew on his toes. He's doing a word. Um, so the young at heart group, um, Brother Andrew, and we are blessed in men's meeting because we get a little sneak preview as well. Um, in young at heart, you've been going over a word that's maybe difficult to understand or something that... Um, you want some clarity on. So, so far, you've done um, convocation, predestination, and sanctification. Uh, so, if you've got a word for young at heart that you want Brother Andrew to cover, you need to get that to him quickly because you've only got two weeks before the next young at heart. Amen. 
All right, I haven't got any other announcements, so we'll sing our next hymn, and, um, which is, uh, to Jesus my Savior, we'll sing our next hymn, and the children can make their way down to Sunday school. If you want to use the creche, Charlotte will be out in the foyer, uh, and she can take the little ones downstairs. Um, it is available if you want it. Amen. All right. <laughs> If you have your Bibles with you, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We are coming towards the end of our study on um, the kings. We've not got far to go now before uh, Babylon will come and take the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity. So we've just got a few more kings to look at. Um, just by way of summary, again, to remind you that after Solomon, the kingdom was split into two. The northern kingdom of Israel was ruled by Jeroboam the uh, first. He was Solomon's servant. He was promised um, by Ahijah the prophet, if you serve the Lord, if you obey the word, if you follow God's commands, you will have a kingdom like David's. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Jeroboam set up a false religious system in the north to stop anybody heading down to Jerusalem. And Jeroboam continued as the rest of the kingdom would follow in his footsteps. He was a bad king, and every king after him was as bad or worse. Um, so you often had the phrase, uh, he followed in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and made Israel to sin. There wasn't a single good king in the north they were all bad. In the southern kingdom of Judah, Rehoboam was the first king. That was Solomon's son. Um, and he was the first uh, king to, to rule in the southern kingdom of Judah. And out of all of the kings there, 20 who sat on the throne, only eight were good kings. And um, 
Again, you can kind of see the turmoil in the north. Uh, Asa was the first good king of the south, and you can look at, um, you know, the, the, like the civil war that went on in the north. Um, you know, uh, Jeroboam's son Nadab was killed by Baasha, and then uh, Baasha's son Elah was uh, killed, and then Zimri uh, committed, actually committed suicide, uh, and then Omri um, kind of took the throne, and then. Ahab uh, was Omri's son, and Ahaziah and Jehoram, uh, and then there was another dynasty chain. So you had lots of families ruling in the north, but you always had David's line ruling in the south. Um, and it's interesting that even when you had bad kings in the north, you had incredible prophets like Elijah and Elisha, um, you know, during Joash's reign in the north. Um, Jonah um, was a prophet, uh, and the same you know, uh, in, in, the, in the south. Um, I tried to put in the prophets when the, uh, the, the prophets were kind of, um, you know, prophesying to the king so we could get an idea of the timeline. So uh, we are coming to, um, oh, my days, I didn't realize how many there were. We are, there we are, Josiah. Uh, so we're coming to the last good king of Judah, or the last good king, uh, and he is Josiah. And during Josiah's reign, um, Jeremiah was prophesying, and Nahum was prophesying, even though he was making um, prophecies more towards Edom, he was still prophesying at the time. And Zephaniah was also prophesying during the time of Zechariah, I think. Yeah, Zechariah. Sorry, I've typed that in wrong. Zechariah was prophesying during the time of Josiah as well. So we come to, oh my days, I've not had a good week this week, I've not been well, um, but that's meant to say Josiah, the last good king. Okay. Josiah, the last good king. Um, So in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, And verse 1, it says this, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images, and the molten images, and they break down the altars of Balaam in in his presence, and the images that were on uh, on high above them. He cut down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images, he break in pieces, and made dust of them, and strode it upon the graves of them that sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Simeon, even under Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images into powder, and cut down the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masaiah, the the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time together today and for this opportunity to come around your word. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, we pray that you would help us uh, to learn uh, uh, from Josiah's uh, godly example, Lord, and the love that he had for the word of God. And Father, I pray that you would help us to apply that to our hearts and to our lives and to uh, see uh, the benefit, uh, the blessing, uh, the encouragement, the help that the word of God has when applied to our hearts and lives correctly. So Father, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts today. And whatever the need is here in this building or for those watching online, we pray that needs would be met, burdens would be lifted, souls would be saved, and ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ would indeed be glorified. We pray and ask all of these things in his most precious and wonderful name. Amen. So Josiah was the last godly king. He was the last good king. And his reign, uh, we are told, lasted for 31 years. Um, And by the end of his days... The Holy Spirit would write this epitaph over his life. In 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 25, it says this, Like unto him 
Was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might? What's interesting is even some of the good kings that we've looked at started good, but didn't end so good. You know, Hezekiah, uh, for example, comes to mind straight away. Uh, Uzziah, um, remember, was a good king and then ended up trying to sacrifice in the temple. But Josiah not only was the last good king, but he was a good king from beginning to end. And, you know, in two kings, we read that there wasn't a king like him before. And that is incredible praise for a life well lived. And what's interesting is this life, um, you know, of him turning to the Lord, he wasn't an older person. He was a young person when he began to seek the Lord. In verse 3, we read, in the eighth year of his reign. Um, Well, he was only eight years old when he came to the throne. In the eighth year of his reign, it says that when he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. So at just 16 years of age, he begins to take the things of God seriously. Do you know that's when we probably lose most of our youngsters? As soon as they get into comp, they're too cool for church, church is too old, too boring, there's too much peer pressure, um, and that's when we lose them. But God can do incredible things with youngsters who just have a love for the Lord. Josiah was 16 years of age when he began to seek the Lord. And I'm sure his faith was far from perfect at this point. You know, he wasn't acquainted with much of the scripture at all. But what we see here is there's a, there's a decision in his heart to seek the things of God. Um, what we see then four years later, because it says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the Lord. And then in the twelfth year, he began to get rid of the idols, to get rid of the high places. You know, so he begins to seek the Lord at 16. At 20, he recognizes the dangers of these high places. He recognizes the destruction and the discouragement and the distress that these idols can cause in people's lives. So he begins to take action. What this means is is that what he's kind of, his faith is put into action. You know, it's all very well and good coming to church, but if we don't do anything with what we hear in church, it's all very well and good studying our Bibles for our devotions, but if that's all we do and we never put that into practice, we're wasting our time. There's absolutely no point. Josiah begins to purge the land of Judah from all idolatry, and what's interesting is that that he even burnt the bones of the priests. Um, and that's really interesting. Two Kings gives us a bit more detail on that. So if you turn to Two Kings chapter 23, Two Kings chapter 23 and verses 15 says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place uh, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both the altar and the high place. He broke down and burnt the high place and stamped it to small powder and burnt the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres and burnt them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. Then he said, what title is this that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they let the bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Josiah is actually fulfilling a 300-year-old prophecy. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13 And we see in the first two verses that behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones 
shall be burnt upon thee. How incredible um, the word of God is. You know, some people say, oh yeah, well that must have just been written after the event and that's just somebody. God's word is perfect. You know, how God can describe things that are going to happen hundreds of years down the line and yet people today say, ah, you can't trust this word. Well, God's word is perfect. We might not understand it all, but that doesn't mean the problems with God's word. That means the problems with us. If we don't understand something in God's word, God's word's not wrong. We're wrong. You know, but what tends to happen in the world today is we try and mold and fit the world so that it kind of um, makes God's word make sense, but that's not what's meant to happen. We're meant to read God's word, and through uh, the, 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 the glasses, if you like, of God's word, we are then able to see the, the world for how it truly is. God had said that Josiah would do exactly what he did 300 years before Josiah did it. Now, bear in mind, we looked at Josiah's father last week. Ammon, even though he was only on the throne for two years, remember, he, he did what his father did. Manasseh was one of the worst kings Judah had, and he followed in his father's footsteps, and he did not repent like his father did. So Ammon, you could say, was the worst. But Josiah was Ammon's son. You know, just because we might come from a family that's dysfunctional doesn't mean we have to be dysfunctional. Just because we come from a family that wants nothing to do with the scripture doesn't mean that we uh, are going to turn out the same. You know, being in mind that Josiah came from one of the most ungodliest kings, he still had a love for the word. He had a love for the word of God. And the word of God has been gathering dust for some time uh, in the royal household. You know, it, it's, it's incredible that, you know, when we come uh, to Josiah, uh, we see the growth of this young man. He comes to the throne at eight. At 16, he starts to seek the Lord. At 20, he starts to cleanse uh, the land of its idols. Uh, and then in the 18th of his uh, uh, year of his reign, when he purged uh, the land uh, of the idols, he sends people down to start fixing the house of God, to repair the temple. Uh, so at 26 years of age, he starts to repair the temple. That tells us it took six years to get rid of the mess that the ungodly kings had caused in Israel. All of the idols, all of the high places, all of the groves, all of the false uh, religious systems that had been set up, it took six years to get rid of that. That's how much stuff the land was steeped in idolatry. <clears throat> and then Josiah's attention is turned to the house of God. The house of God is in a mess. Uh, since the time of Josiah's grandfather Manasseh, um, the house had just been... And remember, Manasseh reigned for 55 years. So, you know, for half a century, the house of the Lord um, has just been in disarray. Um, it's incredible uh, that an offering was taken. And in verse 12, remember, Josiah sends the men. In verse 12, it says, the men did the work faithfully. And it's incredible when you think about it um, that the reason this church is still here is because of over the years of faithful men. And that doesn't necessarily the man that stands in the pulpit because oftentimes churches in Wales have been left without any people to stand in the pulpit, but it still takes the work of faithful people to keep the church going. Uh, and these men did the work faithfully. Uh, it says in verse 14, when they had brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the Lord of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaph and the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaph. And Shaph carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to the servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaph the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. 
and Shaphan read it before the king. Do you notice the difference there? I want you to see a difference. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, and I want you to read it. Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, in verse 15, the scribe, what did he find? Read it out loud. I have found the book of the law. Okay, now go down and see in verse 18 what Shaphan said. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given what? Can you notice a difference? Do you notice any difference? What? A book and the book. Hilkiah said, I have found the book. Shaphan says, Hilkiah's found a book. You see, that's the problem in the, in the church today. That's the problem in the nation today. To some people, the Bible is just a book. It's no different from any other book. You know, it might be revered just like the, you know, the Quran or the, the Hindu Vedas or the, uh, you know, the book of Confucius or um, it might even be kind of respected similar to the works of Shakespeare or Dickens or any other uh, literary greats. And to some, it's just a book. But it's not just a book. It's the book. It is the word of the Lord. Uh, the word of the Lord will never pass away. Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will pass away. But guess what? The word of the Lord will stand forever. You cannot destroy this word. People have tried for centuries. I mean, Satan tried it right back in the beginning. Yea, hath God said. Satan always alters the word. He altered the word back in the beginning of the garden. He altered the word when he was tempting the Lord Jesus Christ, when he misquoted a psalm to say that the angels would give charge over thee. Uh, so uh, it's not a new tactic to change and alter and attack the word of God. You know, it's, it's funny that lots of other works don't get attacked as much as the word of God gets attacked. You know, we have watered down the word of God. You know, many, there are so many Bible versions available today, and it, it, it does my head in. And I, it never used to bother me that much until I was witnessing to a Muslim in London. And the Muslim said to me, we have one Quran. You have thousands of so-called Bibles, so which one is true? You can't argue with that. Because people over the years have made money from the word of God. Because we've altered it. We've watered it down. We've changed it. We've tried to make it easier to understand and easier to accept and easier. But what has happened is, is we've just caused confusion. Because people view it as a book. Not as the book. Can I say this to you? How you react to the book tells us how you view it. If it's just a book, one of many you possess, then it'll never change your life. But if it is the book, it'll make an eternal difference in your life. Notice how Josiah reacted to this. First of all, verse 19 tells us that he heard the word. It says, it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. When the word of God was read, King Josiah's heart was broken. He rent his clothes. We know that when you rend your clothes, that is a sign of remorse. It's a sign of sorrow. It's a sign of heartbreak. It's a sign of ex repentance. It expressed the utmost grief. It expressed the utmost loss. It expressed uh, the utmost grief. It was a public and powerful demonstration of that grief. And what Josiah was saying is that he was devastated that God's word had been hidden away for so long and that it had been lost to the nation. That word had the power to change the course of the nation, but the nation had disregarded it. The nation had dis disused it. The nation had done away with it. The nation wanted nothing to do with it. And as a result, it was ineffectual, ineffective. He wasn't able to do anything when he was gathering dust. 
It doesn't matter how many Bibles you own. It doesn't matter how many Bibles are on your bookshelf. If they stay on your bookshelf and gather dust, they'll never make a blind bit of difference to your life. They've got to be open. They've got to be read. We've got to hear the word of God. You know, this it breaks my heart sometimes when, you know, when you kind of ask kids questions. I remember a couple of years ago, we asked a question about Christmas. And do you know, the majority of the kids sat in the class had no idea that Jesus Christ had anything to do with Christmas. According to a recent survey, you can go on yougov.uk and, and check this out. According to a recent survey, Jesus Christ is fourth on people's lists when it comes to associating associations with Easter. Chocolate is number one. Bank holiday is number two. Hot cross buns, ironically, is number three. Jesus Christ is number four. Only 55% of people said that Jesus Christ had anything to do with Easter. That's the state of our nation. Our nation knows nothing about our Christian heritage. Our nation knows nothing because we've treated the word of God like a book, like any other book. Josiah heard the word, but not only did he hear it, he hungered for it. It says in verse uh, uh, 20, and the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the servant of the king, saying, go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. You know, there's a sign that the word has impacted your life. And you want more of it. You know, how is it that as, as Christians, we can read the word of God, and we can read it every single day of our lives, and we can read a passage of scripture over and over and over again, and then at some point, that passage of scripture jumps out so much, and you're like, how have I never seen that before? We've read that verse Thousands of times. But at the time you need it the most, the Lord speaks to your heart and it changes your life. And you have a hunger for it. The more you read it, the more you want to read it. Job said this, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. It was more important to him than food. Remember Joshua said about feeding uh, upon the, the word. Josiah hungered for the word, and he just wanted to know more. And as a result, the next thing he does is he sends word uh, to the prophet S. Hilder to find out more. Um, and it's really interesting. You know, why, uh, why is there a woman uh, prophetess. He, he, he tells uh, Hilkiah and Shaphan to, to go to Hilda in verse 22, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom. Um, why, why did he go to her? It's possible that at this point, Jeremiah's ministry is quite young in its, you know, in its fledgling stage, as it were. But it's interesting that every time you see a woman prophetess in Israel, it's at a time of great apostasy. It's at a time of great spiritual decline. You go back to the book of Judges when Deborah uh, was in a position uh, and uh, it, it just indicates the state of the nation. And Isaiah says this, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Um, so in ancient Israel, Having a woman in charge was characteristic and a consequence of apostasy in the land at the time. Um, Helda, you, you look at what Helda actually says from verse 24 uh, to verse 28. Um, she doesn't hold back. She tells him exactly uh, what is going to happen. 
You know, you have uh, women in the Bible. A lot of times people say, oh, the Bible's so down on women, it's unbelievable. And no, it's not. You look at women like Hilda, Deborah, Anna, Miriam. Uh, you look at those, those women. What Hilda does here is she simply says what God's going to do. God was going to judge Israel. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Josiah would not live to see it. Uh, it's incredible that Josiah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we see that because of his tender heartedness. In verse 27, Hilda says this, Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. He had a tender and submissive heart. Oftentimes we read the word of the Lord and we are quite hard-hearted towards it. We kind of want to find a loophole. This verse tells me not to do this. How can I get around it? Is there some small print that I can find? Is there something that I can do which will kind of bypass uh, the fact that this is convicting me. But Josiah was just tender-hearted. He hungered for the word. The king humbled himself. He surrendered his heart to the word of God. And that's the kind of heart that God is looking for in all of us. He heard the word. He hungered for the word. He heralded the word. It says in verse 30 uh, that the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people great and small and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. It was the king who read out the word. It wasn't Hilkiah the priest. It wasn't Shaphan the scribe. It was the king himself who read the words of the book in the ears of his people. Remember what we've said about every good king? Every good king sort of did the right thing, but they didn't remove the idols. They didn't remove the high places. So it was almost as if the king was saying, you know, do as I say, not as I do type of thing. But it just seems that Josiah is real. And he's like, no, I, I'm going to read this book. I'm going to read it in the ears of the people because I want them to see that it's real in my life. And if they can see that it's real in my life, perhaps they'll have a bit more tenderness towards it themselves. He made it his duty to publish the truth of the scripture to everybody. Now, we need to understand what Judah is like at this time. So if you turn to Zephaniah, okay, Zephaniah chapter 1. And we'll read the first couple of, we'll read the first six verses. The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Geraldiah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the cherubims of the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm and they that turn back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Judah wasn't a pleasant place. You know, when you read that and you see the state of the nation, Josiah didn't preach to the choir. Josiah shared the word, if you like, with sinners. 
And you might say, well, it made very little difference, because look at the state of it. It may have made very little difference, but he still shared the word. You know, oftentimes we say, what's the point in witnessing to people? They don't pay any attention to it. But we do, that's not our job. Paul said that one plants, one waters, but it's God that gives the increase. You know, you might say, oh, there's no point in talking to my work colleague because they just don't want to know. That might be the very time that their heart is soft enough to receive what you have to say. But it's not your job for the increase. Your job is just to plant and the water. That's what you were meant to be faithful in. You know, when any any of us who, or any of you who do that gardening stuff, the hard work is the planting and the watering. You can do nothing about whether or not something flowers. You can do nothing about whether. All you do is you plant a seed and you water it. That's it. And it's the same with sharing the gospel. You could have said to Josiah, well, what was the point? What was the point in him reading that word to a bunch of sinners who weren't going to do anything about it? The point was he gave them the word. The point was he gave them the chance and the opportunity to accept that word or to reject that word. And that's all we do when we witness. We give people an opportunity to accept or reject. He heralded the word, but he also heeded the word. In verse 31, it says, The king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the book. That's the thing. Josiah didn't just talk the talk. Josiah walked the walk. He was obedient to the word of God. He wasn't half-hearted. He didn't pick and choose, you know, right, what shall I be obedient to? What shall I apply to my life? What shall I pick out of this? It wasn't a multiple choice thing for him. He was just obedient. He obeyed with all his heart and with all his soul. And we're not meant to be just hearers of the word. We're meant to be doers. It's meant to make a difference in our lives. We're meant to apply it to our heart and to our life. I've said this before. You know, there's been many books that I've read in my life. I thought, oh, wow, that was a good book. But that's as far as it goes. It was just a good book. There's only been one book that has changed my life. There's only been one book that's literally changed my eternity. And that's the book that pointed me to Christ. That's the book that told me what Christ did for me. That's the book that told me how much God loved me. That's the book that told me all that God gave up for me so that I could spend eternity with him. There might be some books in this world that have an influence on us, but there's no other book in this world that will change your life so drastically. And Josiah was just obedient to the word of the Lord. He was determined that the word of God would rule his life. Think about it. He had the responsibility of ruling others. And in order for him to do that correctly, something had to rule his life. You know, if we want to be the right kind of husband or the right kind of wife, then the word of God has got to rule our lives. If we want to be the right kind of work colleague, if we want to be the right kind of um, son or daughter, if we want to be the right kind of friend, if we want to be the right kind of church member, if we want to be the right kind of anything, then the word of God has got to rule in our hearts. It's incredible when we think of Josiah, you think this guy is going to go on and he's just going to rule forever. This is, this is the perfect king. This is the best king uh, Judah's had, you know, since David. And, and this, this guy is just going to go on forever. But look at 2 Chronicles 35 and verse 20. You, know, we'll, you, you look at the type of king Josiah was. In verse 18, it says that there was no Passover like this kept in Israel 
from the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of Josiah's reign, there was a Passover like they'd never, ever had before. And you would think, wow, this king, this king is just going to go on forever. Verse 20 says, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against Karamish by uh, Ephrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearken not unto the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am so wounded. His servants therefore took him out of the chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. In some ways, the king's premature death was mercy, if you like, of God, because it saved him from seeing the demise that would come upon Judah. You know, sometimes bad things happen to us, and we kind of blame God for them, but we don't know what those bad things are actually saving us from further down the road. You know, we really, really, really wanted this to happen, and it's unfair, God, that this has happened, and why haven't you answered my prayer, and this is so mean and so unfair, and, and we're like a spoiled child who says to his parents, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, why are you making me eat this healthy food? I hate you. But then we don't know what God has saved us from further down the road, because if we'd got our own way here, disaster may very well have been awaiting us here. And you might say, well, why didn't Josiah reign and reign and reign and reign? Because judgment was coming to Judah. Israel had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. Babylon was knocking on the door because judgment was coming. Um, In some ways, the king's premature death shows that it was God's mercy upon him because it saved him from seeing the demise. But in other ways, it shows us what happens when we take matters into our own hands. You know, he was so good in hearing the word, in heeding the word, in heralding the word. But in this instance, he failed to listen to the word of God. And maybe this was the first time in his life. Maybe the first time in his life he refused to listen to God's word and disaster struck. You know, when we really want something bad enough, we'll convince ourselves that it's okay to have, regardless of what God's word says. But we just need to be sensitive. The nation mourned. They'd lost a great man. They'd lost a great king. And this was the last good king of Judah. It says in verse 25 that Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. Jeremiah laments because he knows what's on the way. He'll no longer have a good king in Judah. And in just a few years... The earthly monarchy will be done away with. Josiah hungered, heard, heralded, and heeded the word of God. It made a difference in his life. My question to you this morning is this. Do you view this as a book or the book? Has it made a difference in your life? If it hasn't, then I pray that you would read it with an open heart and an open mind and allow the Lord to speak to you. If you know and love him as your Lord and Savior, 
then this book shouldn't just be a book because this book has already changed your life. But this book needs to be applied to our lives every single day. Father, we thank you again for this time together this morning, for this opportunity to come around your word. Father, we just pray you continue to speak to our hearts today, Lord. We pray you continue to help us. And when it comes to applying this word to our hearts and to our lives, and Father, I just pray that you continue to speak to our hearts today as we come around your table now, Lord. We pray you'd help us to recognize the importance uh, of this word and what it means to us. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward at this time. You know, it's incredible that nothing the Bible says is by accident, coincidence, or mistake. We've just been talking about the importance of the word. I've been in to- talking about how incredible the word is. And in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it tells us that the word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word is with God and the word was God. And that word became flesh. That word came and dwelt among men. You know, what does the word do? The word describes. The Lord Jesus Christ came and described to man for the first time what God was like. You know, the word came and dwelt among the people so that they could have an understanding of who God was. But that word came Christ came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know, people still reject the word today, just like they did back then, not recognizing, like we said, Christ is number four on the list of what represents Easter or what Easter means. The world today has no concept of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for them upon the cross of Calvary. And when we come to a, a, a moment like this, as we come to the elements on the table, the bread and the cup, we once again are reminded of all that Christ gave up for us. The word became flesh. The word left the glories of heaven. The, the word left, you know, the, the incredible scenes and sights of heaven to come down. You think about it. You know, a, a baby has no say in, in what their parents do. They are literally in the hands of their parents. Can you imagine that the trust that God had in putting himself in Mary and Joseph's arms for that length of time to look after him until he was ready um, to start that public ministry. The Lord gave up so much for us. And when we come around the table, we're reminded of the body that was broken for us on the cross of Calvary. We're reminded of the blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And we remember all that he did for us so that we could have that home in heaven. I wonder if Dad would ask a blessing on the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed opportunity of meeting around your table to partake of these elements, Heavenly Father, these representatives of the body and the blood, that body that was broken for us, that body that was given freely for our redemption. And as we meet around this table, our pastor has just said it's a reminder to us of that those events, but it shouldn't just be a monthly reminder, Heavenly Father, we know that we should remember these dreadful events, not just once a year at Easter, not just once a month around the table, but day after day after day, because we owe so much to you, day 
after day after day. We now ask a blessing upon this bread, this representative, this representation of the flesh that was broken for us. These things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. And on the night that the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, after he'd blessed the bread, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Right from the beginning, the Lord reminds us that the life is in the blood. We're also reminded that there is no <clears throat> remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross of Calvary, gave his all for us. And the cup pictures the blood that was shed at Calvary. The, blood, the cup pictures the life that was given at Calvary for us. The cup pictures the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. That our sins are not just covered, but that our sins are atoned for, paid for. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ uttered those words in the Greek, in the English, it's three, it is finished. In the Greek, it's one word to tell us back. Uh, but as he cries out, it is finished in Aramaic, that word meant that it was complete. It was a bank into a meaning. It is paid in full. It means that the perfect sacrifice was found. It means that the prophecies were complete. It means that the debt was paid and that God's purpose of redemption was finally realized. I wonder if Neil has a blessing on the cup. and bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon you, and with your stripes we are healed. So Lord, we ask now for the blessing on the cup that we are about to partake. As we partake of that cup, Lord, may we be reminded firmly once more of what the cost of our salvation was to you. And that day you went to the cross for us, and there bled and died, also that we as sinners may have everlasting life if we 
just for our trust in you. Amen. For we know we ought to share the number of life. There can be no remission of our sin. So I just ask and pray now for all these things. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I will retain the cup and we'll take it together. And as the cup is coming around, we'll sing our next hymn as well. cup was a picture of the blood that was shed for us at the cross of Calvary. The Lord Jesus Christ said that every time we were to drink this, we were to do it in remembrance of him. Father, once again, we are thankful, Lord, for the price that was paid for us at Calvary. And Father, we never take that sacrifice for granted. Father, we are so grateful for the fact that you gave up so much that you gave up everything so that we could gain everything. Father, we are so grateful for the fact that you took upon yourself our sin so that we could take upon ourselves the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that you would just help us today uh, once again to be mindful of all that you do for us and help us to continually apply your word to our lives so that we might glorify you and because of all that you've done for us. Father, we love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Let's stand and just sing the last uh, few verses of that. And then following this, I'm going to ask Brother Andrew if he would just close us in a word of prayer. Thanks, Brother Andrew. <laughs>
created Nicodemus. And he said, I came not to judge the world, but I came to save the world. Mm. And we thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus did not summon those 10,000 angels, but he died for our sins, because he loved us so much, sinners, no we were, that he wanted to populate heaven and indeed the new earth with those who, who had been ruined by sin but who have been restored by his wonderful grace. And we thank you, Father, that the day will come when the Lord Jesus will return to his earth and then will indeed look at themselves and say, where, where sin abounded, grace hath superabounded. But just as sin has reigned unto death, so grace might reign through Jesus Christ our Lord <coughs> and for us. Father, we thank you for such, such a Savior and that we indeed we were to join with those in heaven us to God by his own blood, and we thank you that the day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the eternal praise and glory. We pray, Father, for someone listening who has listened to these words that does not know the assurance that the Lord Jesus is their Savior. <coughs> may they cry out to him for mercy, and may they know that you are a true God that keeps your word, and you say, before they call, I will answer. Like the Lord Jesus, that we shall not turn from your word, either to the right hand.